Hey everyone, Jeff Lee here for Able City. Thank you so much for joining us today for our exclusive first look at the very exciting products that Canon just announced. Now, if you saw the live stream, you saw that today the Cinema EOS C300 Mark III was announced, as well as the Cine Servo 25 to 250. So, I'm very fortunate to be joined today by Paul Hawkshurst and Ryan Snyder from Canon Pro Reps, who will be joining us uh, a little for a deep dive looking at some of the gear and also answering any questions you may have. So please feel free to drop your questions into the YouTube live stream. Jeff Smith, who's joining us also, will be able to moderate and let us know what questions you may have. So first of all, thank you, Paul and Ryan, for joining us so much today. Very busy, I'm sure you guys are <laughs> setting up, uh, doing a whole video setup. But uh, you know, very pretty exciting. So uh, obviously, we have two new products. That are, I mean, you're not so much of products, I should say, but in the Cinema EOS family, the release for us, what's pretty exciting is the new C300 Mark III and the Cine Servo 25 to 250. Uh, great continuation of the 17 to 120 and the 50 to 1000. Uh, but first, I thought we'd talk a little bit about the camera. Uh, and I know both of you had cameras with you, but uh, we, a couple of key specs that we saw from your presentation. So we have, of course, a new 4K sensor that uses yeah. something called DGO or dual gain output, dual which we definitely want to talk output. about. Right. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, dynamic range we'll talk about as well. It uses a new Digic DV7 sensor, which is exciting. Um, but a couple of bullets that I put up here, enhanced mm. high frame rate capabilities. So 180p in a 2K crop mode, which is exciting. Uh, modular design, great codec support that we're familiar with, including uh, some raw light. And of course, proxy recording, which we'll dig into a little bit. Uh, but actually, first question, I think, probably for Paul, dual gain output. So what does that really mean? Can you kind of break that down for us? Yeah, um, yeah, because it, it's pretty interesting. Um, a lot of people, and I'll start off right away, is that a lot of people kind of confuse it for dual native ISO, which it is not. Um, that's a totally different system. But for this, basically, is a newly designed sensor, and what they did when they were looking at the sensor, they realized that all of Canon Cineo sensors are split into two di diodes at the pixel level. So every pixel on the sensor actually has two light capturing diodes. All right. Now, we use this for dual pixel autofocus. All right. Um, so what's happening is that each of those diodes is actually capturing the same image information. So you actually have, at the sensor level, two different frames, but they're exact same frame. I don't know why I say two different, two exact same frames of the exact same image, right? Well, the Canon engineers realized that, hey, we can rate these two diodes at different gain levels. So one of those diodes is rated at a lower gain, and because of that, it's a much, much lower noise, where the other diode is rated at a higher gain, and that is satisfying the, the proper exposure need of the pixel. So all of the light, the saturation that the sensor needs is being saturated by that, that higher uh, gain diode. Well, you have those two, then you have those two frames, one a lower gain, lower noise, one of a higher gain, with the right exposure. You combine the two of them together at the sensor level, and this is done before it gets dumped to processing. Um, then you have one combined image that covers a really wide dynamic range. And it pushes, the big thing though, is got to think about it, is it pushes the noise floor down even further. And I think for me, that's really the exciting part is, and I, I can't wait for people to get it in their hands and to start shooting and actually testing, you know, how low, how like how deep, deep, deep into the shadows we push the noise because, um, we're, I mean, we're getting usable dynamic range far beyond any Canon camera I've ever seen. Right, and what was interesting about the live stream, you mentioned that it's 16 and a half stop, but right. you can, in certain frame rates, that changes a little bit because it's not able to utilize the full DGO or dual gain output circuitry? Yeah, absolutely. So what's happening is that if you're in the 4K or uh, 2K Super 35 mode, so that's using the full, all the sensor, if you exceed 60 frames a second, then it's kind of reverting back down to 15 stops, what we were we're talking about for the previous generation of sensors. Um, but if you're doing the 2K crop mode, all right, 
the 2K crop mode allows you uh, to go up to 120 frames with the extended dynamic range. So. Right. So speaking of high frame rate, you mentioned 120, but it, the camera also supports, I believe for the first time, 180 FPS at uh, 2K crop out of the 4K S35 sensor. Is that correct? Yeah, so when you're shooting when you're shooting the Super 35 sensor, you can get up to 120, whether it's 4K or 2K, right? When we go into the Super 16 millimeter crop mode, which is cropping into the 2K pixels, then we're going up to 180 frames a second. So it's it's much faster frame rates that we've had outside of like the C700 level. So right. And then as far as the record, other record options, can you just speak upon that, uh, upon that a little bit as far as options and internal, yeah. you know, media? Yeah, absolutely. So like the C100 Mark II, it has uh, two CF Express card slots. Um, and that's you can record the CF uh, or the Cinema Raw Light to those, as well as XF ABC. The Cinema Raw Light follows the same rules as the Cinema Raw Light we've seen in the C200 and the C500 Mark II. So up to 30 frames a second, you get 12-bit raw. Exceeding 30 frames a second, you're going to get 10-bit raw, right? If I'm shooting in the Super 35 mode in raw, it's 4K. It's the exact 4K pixels. If I choose the Super 16 mode, it cuts in directly to the 2K pixels for RAW. So you have both the 4K and 2K RAW, but 2K RAW is a crop into the actual pixels, and that's the Super 16 mode. So right. beyond that, the XFAVC, um, like I said in the video, all the modes of XFAVC are 10-bit 422. And proxy recording, oh. of course, still have, exists. So, proxy recording, and this is actually something I didn't talk about in the video, was that so this camera will record proxies for both XFABC and RAW as well at all frame rates. And that was something in the C500 that they were missing. So for SD cards or also CF Express? To SD card. Yeah. So again, another slot for the SD card. And it's the same as the 2K. It's the 2K um, 8-bit 420 uh, file. So... Now, mentioning the C500 like you just did, the mm -hmm. modularity, of, of course, stays the same in terms yeah. of the overall uh, options that you have, and also even the footprint, right? It has the same optical center height. Oh, I mean, not only that, this is something I, I really kind of harp on, um, is that it's the exact same body, the exact same weight, and the exact same ba balance. Uh, so, I mean, if you have, like, say you had both of them on set, right? And you had a gimbal, you had a jib, you had a steady cam. I mean, you could swap them in and out on those things like, faster than you could say bananas. I don't know. You know, it's just going, going. I mean, it's the same, exact same thing. So all of your accessories, all your third-party accessories, all the can accessories, just they mix and match perfectly across the board. Right, definitely. So all the third-party support, and not just the C500 Mark II, but the C200 and C700 to some extent, like the base plates, because the same optical uh, height, correct? Yeah, because of the optical height, um, the C700, C200, C500 Mark II, C300 Mark III, they all share that same optical height. So yeah, so like base plates and rod systems will will line up. Got it. Sorry, Bob. Just trying to fix my camera here. But in the meantime, uh, you guys also released a short called Boneyard Ballet, shot by actually able client Steve Holleran. Uh, which will air a little bit, uh, but just speaking of balance, which is really perfect, like the camera is balances so well, and uh, of course with the new uh, 25 to 250 being the similar weight to the 17 to 120, right? I think that's a great sort of balance between operation and great focal length options. Uh, so I guess we'll throw this one to you, Ryan. So any comments on that as far as the balance and usage, and you have the lens in front of you, so you can talk about it most directly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's, you know, my favorite part about the lens. I mean, other than the focal length, uh, which is what everybody's been asking for. Uh, everybody loves the 17 to 120. Um, and the clients that I've spoken to, they're just like, you know, we love this thing. It's it's everything that we need for Super 35 coverage. We just wish it had more range. We wish it had an extender built in or something like that, just to give it a little bit more punch. Um, so the 25 to 250 range is just awesome. Uh, but uh, then um, 
the fact that it's so compact, the fact that it's so familiar to the 17 to 120. Um, you know, I, I've actually got a 17 to 120 here and, you know, I, I put it up next to it. Now, obviously, we're talking different mounts, uh, PL versus EF, but you can see how similar these are uh, next to each other. Um, so that's just amazing to me. Um, and it really opens up, uh, you know, the flexibility of using them in conjunction on, uh, together on set or um, uh, as a pair. Ooh. So, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yeah. There, it is. there you go. Yeah. Uh, okay, so they're about the same in terms of uh, weight, right? One's just a touch heavier, the 25 to 250? Yeah, the, the 25 to 250 is 6.7 pounds versus 6.3 pounds on the, uh, I'm sorry, the 25 to 250, yeah, 6.7 pounds versus 6.3 pounds on the uh, 17 to 120. And then this is uh, measuring just a little bit longer, 11.1 uh, inches uh, versus... Um, um, 10.3. Right. Use the same grip, though, of course, between the 17 120 and the 25 to 250. It's it's uh, it's almost identical as far as the grip uh, goes. Uh, obviously, they have different values, um, so you, you you know you can't. House, uh, so you can't use this grip and take it off and put it on a 17 to 120 and vice versa. Um, they each have uh, specific values for that particular lens. Um, but uh, absolutely, if you if you know the feel of the 17 to 120, this is going to feel right at home. Right. And as far as accessories, matte boxes, all using the same 114 millimeter front clamping diameter. Yeah. Yep. And it's got a four foot, I believe, uh, MOD or... Sure. Yeah. Four four foot uh, minimum focusing distance, uh, and like the seventeen to one twenty, and all the all broadcast, you know, uh, kind of lenses. It does have the macro function as well, so you can depress that, and that actually brings if you rotate that all the way over, that brings your uh, minimum point of focus within twenty five centimeters of the front element of the lens. Um, so it's awesome for really really close up stuff, um, as well as you know, kind of that, um, you know. Uh, kind of cool effect when you you engage it and it just throws everything out of focus, like maybe to go but you know into a commercial it. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, on that note, so it's a Super 35 lens natively without the 1.5x extender, but you mentioned in a live stream video that with the extender, it'll cover I think it was a 43.2 millimeter image circle. So that would yeah, cover I that mean, in the or two full frame. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's another really cool part of this lens is that, you know, with the flick of a switch, it's right here on the back. You've got that uh, 1.5. You engage that. That not only makes this into a uh, 37.5 to 350 on Super 35, but also will cover um, full frame and um, a really, really, you know, um, great thing about that is it, it only loses one stop at that point. So you've got you know, a, a really nice uh, uh, T4.4 to 5.9 lens on a full frame. And I um, want to mention really quickly, uh, I think you labeled on the lens that it ramps ever so slightly, I think at the higher end of the focal length range, like the 17 yeah. did, or? Yeah, exactly. And you'll see that, you know, at, on, on the zoom ring, um, once it, it gets to this, uh, this orange part here, uh, it's only past 187 millimeters. Uh, that that ramping starts happening. So like I said in the video, you've got a seven to one uh, zoom ratio flat wide open, uh, which is just an incredible range on this for, for the size and weight of it. Now you both mentioned the dual pixel autofocus and of course the EF version of this lens will support the dual pixel autofocus. Uh, and we've all used DAF and seen how amazing it really works. But what I found really interesting about the new camera was that you mentioned there's sort of a ramping mode, which will mimic a human focus puller. Can you guys talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, definitely. And actually, this is this is something that was in the C500 Mark II as well. And basically, it's it's not really a new mode, more is it's just a an a reapproach to the algorithm used for the the ramping. So the I mean, if you've used the dual pixel autofocus, you know, especially in the, in the more recent cameras, there's a, a lot of great customizing features that you can do with it from the speed of it to the sensitivity of it um and really what they did was they just they looked at the the algorithm for how how it snaps from one point of focus to the other and said let's try to make it more of a, of a ramp than a snap 
in a way. Try to give it a little bit more of an organic feel to it. Yeah, you could still adjust all the speeds mm -hmm. and the sensitivity of it, um, which is really great. But this is just kind of built in by default. It, it, it has a, a little bit of a, a, a slower start. Then it hits that, that speed that you set. And then once it achieves critical focus, it kind of slows back into it again. So it's a, it's a, it's a really cool uh, little addition that they did. We'll have to see um, what people think of it. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Now, on the back to the camera, uh, you mentioned that there's something called EIS or electronic image stabilization, which is different than in-body image stabilization or IBIS or obviously yes. o uh, OIS, optical image stabilization. Yeah. So can you guys talk a little bit about EIS and what that means? Yeah, and uh, and again, uh, same thing is was in the C500 Mark II as well, um, and basically it's it's on sensor stabilization, but it's not the sensor's not shaking like it is in IBIS, um, like that. But what it's doing is that um, the camera itself reads the information that's coming from lens. So say take a, a Canon, you know, L series EF lens that has uh, image stabilization in the lens. Uh, the camera will read the information from that lens. And it has an algorithm uh, that can work with the image stabilization on the lens itself, on the sensor. So you're getting some really amazing uh, image stabilization if you're using the two in tandem. If you don't have a, a lens that the camera has the metadata for, or a, a EF, like an EF series lens with image stabilization, um, you can go in and put, you can input the focal length of your lens. And the camera itself has a, an in-body kind of database of like, oh, okay, so you're using a 75 millimeter, right? Well, we have a we have an algorithm for 75 millimeter for image stabilization built into the camera, um, and uh, you know it's really interesting because it's there's a, it's a there's a 1.1 times crop on it, and uh, and it's it's not that bad, you know, 1.1 times crop is not as much. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, okay, you know, it's not as bad as what I thought about, but um, but it only works in XF AVC, and that's true on both the C500 and the C300 Mark III. Um, but it's something that we're seeing, you know, at least in our markets, uh, that people are, are really liking it on the C500 Mark II. So, so hopefully it carries over to the, the Mark III. And you mentioned our, our demo film, uh, Boneyard Ballet, um, and uh, the EIS was used uh, very much so with the uh, drone shots. And uh, apparently it did a, a fantastic job of just smoothing out. Right, and they had that on movies and gimbals or uh, and a drone as well and, and handheld a lot inside the airplane and outside. And they, Steve was able yeah. to use that to great effect. Yeah, absolutely. Now, can you take that EIS information? And you mentioned that it works with any EF lenses, but um, you can program in the focal lens. So that would work with mm -hmm. even like a PL mount lens as well? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that. Yeah, and that's because it's you know it's barely on sensor. It's barely the electronic stabilization. So, you know. Now you mentioned it works with the XFABC, but could it work with the the cinema raw light? And you can do that in post production. Does it record that as metadata, or is it just with the no. XF files? Yeah, no. yeah, purely just the the processing. It's something going in on in the processing of the XFABC through the JIGX seven. Um, you know, to get there. But no, there's there's no metadata for that collected. So. And just like the C500 Mark II then, uh, just talking about lens mounts, same as user interchangeable, comes with shims and something you can yeah. do at home? Exactly the same. The same lens mounts as the C500 Mark II. Um, so yeah. So you got the PL mount, you got the EF locking mount. Um, when you buy the mounts, it comes with the shims. Um, yeah. You can do it at home. If you have a... Uh, more power to you if you have a like a dense kilometer tool um they one of those handheld ones that you can use at home but hey uh four screws and it's in it's out i, I think I've, I've been able to get it down to to 25 seconds that i can i can swap it in is that a record so, we'll, we'll test you on that yeah there's no way there's gotta be somebody way faster than that <laughs> so <laughs> that could be the next uh sort of quarantine challenge how fast can you swap your lens mount on your c500 mark ii or the c300 mark ii so just a <laughs> quick egg i was trying to do it for um a uh addendum video as well i was going to do the lens mount swap and every time i tried to do it fast i just the screws would just blow up all over the place on me and i'd have to fish them out of you know the floor and everything like that so 
Yeah, I slowed down. Every time I try to do it on camera, I just get super nervous about it. And <laughs> uh, so we just have Why to do it where you we don't we don't know you're we're recording you basically. Yeah. <laughs> right. Why well, I would caution against uh, doing it in uh, in the field. <laughs> you got some extra screws around. <laughs> Yeah, and obviously, anytime you do an adjustment like that, back focus needs to be considered. So, of course, if you had a collimator, to Paul's point, it'd be preferable. Yeah. But I guess if you're in a jam and need to swap for whatever reason, you know, if yeah. your B cam is a different mount than your A cam, be wanting yeah. to use the same, you know, or lensing rather, yeah. And it's probably going to work. I mean, you know, just tape tape out your lenses after you do it, and there's a good chance. And if you're rolling with autofocus the whole time, you got you're covered there. So, yeah. And one of my favorite accessories, honestly, that you guys make the uh, is the viewfinder from the C700, or originally from the C700. Yeah. So that still works. Obviously, the you guys were showing pictures of it. Steve was using it during yeah. Born Down Ballet. And I think that's one of the best uh, sort of hidden secrets of that, of the two cameras. Yeah, I mean, for, for me personally, it's kind of the ideal setup of this body style. Um, and I, I would I would have put it in my in my... VPC video if I if I had one with me, <laughs> but um, uh, but no, that's it's an amazing viewfinder. Um, it had a price drop recently, too, um, which is pretty good. And it just it works with the Canon that terminal, the uh, the Canon terminal that you use the the LCD screen with. Um, so that's one of the, the the caveats of it is that if you want to use that viewfinder, you can't use the LCD uh, panel, the touchscreen one that comes with the, the camera. It's either either or type of situation sure. until somebody and makes I know a Paul you mentioned oh sorry go ahead I was just saying until until somebody makes a splitter for it or something so oh that's an interesting idea there you go so the third party uh, aftermarket <laughs> uh, sensory makers that's the next uh, big hit uh, now Paul you mentioned also in your video that lookup tables which is very exciting is definitely a common request that we hear I'm sure you guys hear way more than us so can you talk a little bit about the types of files that are supported. Yeah, so uh, again, it's the same as the C500 Mark II and also the C700 as well. Uh, the file that's supported is, there's only one. It's a .cube that's made in Resolve. So you got to use DaVinci Resolve and then you got to export your LUT as a, as a .cube. Um, and then it, it's really easy. Just go, there's four, four slots of internal memory in the camera. So you can just put it on an SD card, pop it in there, upload it to one of those slots, and then uh, you can just, yeah, roll your, your LUT. The one thing you can't do with that is you cannot bake that LUT in to anything. So, like, even on prox on your proxies, you can't bake that LUT into your proxies. You can just you can only put it out through your, your outputs and your monitoring. Got it. So it's a view-only LUT. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, you know, I love this picture because I just showing the versatility of the camera, it's sort of in an ENG operation, but then at the same time you throw it in a cinema mode with a picture of this of Steve's crew yeah. during the uh, Boneyard Ballet with a big, I think it's a 30 to 300, yep. full on cinema mm -hmm. um, uh, setup. So I do want to take a couple of minutes just to make sure that we're not uh, ignoring anyone that's asking any questions on YouTube Live. Uh, curious, Jeff Smith, if anyone's coming just yet. All right, we'll take that as a no. <laughs> but we do encourage folks watching, ask questions while we have Paul and uh, Ryan here. You know, it's kind of a unique opportunity to just go straight to the source with these two very exciting products. Yeah, yeah right, no, so it's no actually, questions popping up as of yet, Jeff, just letting you know. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. Um, actually, this might be a good moment. If, for those that haven't seen it, uh, we can show Boneyard Ballet. It's a nice sort of uh, showing of working in tight spaces, the, dynamic range when you're in a desert shooting inside an airplane, but also shooting, you know, the darkness of the in-plane versus the outside of the Nevada sun, uh, but also being the use in the movement and, of course, with the actual ballet dancer that they hired for this. So if we don't mind, uh, JC, can we air uh, Boneyard Ballet, please?
I have not been very subtle about my tea drinking. I'm sorry. I have. That's all right. Yeah, pretty cool. So we had a couple of behind-the-scenes stills from that shoot. Um, anything you guys want to add as far as the ergonomics or workflow or any sort of notes coming from Steve when he came back from the field shooting this? I can tell you that as far as the, the 25 to 250, uh, he, he mentions in his interview that uh, they, they, he's not actually used to, to shooting with uh, zooms a lot. And they placed it on one of the rigs and basically forgot that he was using a zoom. Um, and we, we make a, a big deal a lot about, you know, our, our, our zooms, especially our cinema zooms being, you know, really variable primes. And I think that's a testament to it uh, for him to just say, yeah, I, I was able to use it. It's extremely flexible and I didn't see any compromises in it. Right. And obviously we keep talking about specs, but the most important thing about lens is how it looks. And that's sort of the beauty of the Canon optics. And, and this lens inherits all of the uh, other looks from the other set of uh, the cameras of the other generations. Absolutely. That, yeah. that, that warm color tone, um, you know, besides the, the Canon color science that we're known for as being, you know, of nice and warm, um, these lenses are coated uh, warmer for uh, really pleasing skin tones. Uh, minimal breathing that's a that's a huge part of these lenses and uh and of course the um um you know the match the match sets but you know as far as the build and as far as gear locations being able to just you know just swap them in and out of rigs um, it's pretty awesome yeah and i have another picture here that steve provided or behind the scenes and i know there's going to be a bunch of photos released probably on your social media uh, channels and, and interviews and whatnot of Steve, but a lot of them are really insightful and kind of based on his experience. But like I said, perfect balance on the shoulder. Yeah. Uh, you can almost, I wouldn't recommend it, but you can almost take your hand off of it, just kind of would flow on your shoulder because of the perfect weight distribution. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And the grip, you know, we don't talk enough, enough about, you know, how it's designed ergonomically, but it really is, is you know, located on here just at a perfect balance point. Um, so these long handheld shoots, you know, you really don't get fatigued by it. It's, it's a really nice location on it. All right. And of course, silk supports for those who need it in a more broadcast situation, uh, zoom, iris, or focus demands. You have the yep. three pins at the bottom. Yep, yep, 320-pin Hiroshi's. Um, so, yeah, it'll work with the, the focus and zoom demands, and you've got the uh, virtual system um, as well. And the servo drive, you know, just all the, the crazy features that are built into those things, you know, um, being able to set up an actual zoom range um, per user. You know, if a couple people are, are using this, they can actually set up their own parameters as far as how everything operates. Um, I found that, you know, there's a really, you know, great feature being able to um, set the zoom tracking, is, which is basically a limit. Um, but if you're worried about that ramp that happens at that 187 millimeter point, you can set the zoom range, you know, your personal preference to stop right before that happens. So you never even have to worry about it when. I think we lost you a little bit there. What were you just saying uh, there, Ron? Uh, yeah, uh, I was talking about uh, how you can customize the uh, the zoom tracking um, and, uh, you know, different, you know, obviously framing presets and things like that. So you can get this this zoom operation, you know, customized exactly how you want it on the, the servo drive. There's also like different user profiles in there as well, which is cool. So like, you know, if you're it's a rental house or, you know, any kind of broadcast studio where somebody more than one person is using that equipment, they can save their own you know, custom functions into that lens and just pull them up when it's their turn to use it, so. Okay. Um, now, DAF works, of course, to the EF lens mount, but the, the PL mount will support Cook Eye technology for all the metadata exchange. That's right. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Actually, on the servo, I remember, what's the full speed rack from wide to telephoto? It's pretty quick, if I remember correctly. It's like a half a second. Yeah. You want to that that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's actually a uh, there's a little dial right here on the on the servo drive. Um, I don't know if I can get it, but it's yep, uh, I'm working here. It's right right on the back here, and you set that all the way uh, uh, clockwise, and you're looking at a half a second. If you take it down to the slowest setting, um, three hundred yeah three hundred seconds yeah five minutes five minutes yeah so <laughs> that, that that long state of the union type of zoom uh where you don't even know that it's actually zooming in uh, there, you, you can definitely achieve that 
Right, that's great. And obviously, you take it off. I mean, as amazing as that huge range of features, but you take it off and you put cinema style motors on it instead. If you have like a traditional follow focus. Yep. Yep. So all the all the um, rings are geared. Uh, you've got 0.8 and 0.5 on the focus. So two two different choices there. Uh, 0.5 for the zoom, and then the iris, just because it's you know more the broadcast style. Um, that's uh, down at a 0.4. So you can absolutely, you know, take the take the servo drive off. It's three screws. It's even got a handy little spot on the back to 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 hold the screws so you don't lose them. Um, and it comes off really really quickly and easily. Um, and then you've got yeah, just a, a straight up manual cinema lens with a sweet range. And just to clarify, you said a uh, point eight for the focus. Yep, point eight and point five. You got both on there. Yeah. Oh, for focus. Okay, interesting. Mm-hmm. And sort of the usual Canon um, innovations, you're making sure that uh, operators standing behind the camera or the lens can see the lens markings clearly and the yeah. visible and, and low light environments. Yeah, yeah. And it's something, you know, I didn't really notice it uh, but at, at first. But yeah, they're definitely they're on an angle, um, really clear and easy to see. Uh, and you've got the... Um, you know, the luminous paint as well. So if you're using this in low light, just like uh, all of our cine lenses, you actually have glow-in-the-dark uh, numbers on here. Let's see. So I don't have the camera, yeah, fortunately, because kind of for, shame, for, we're usually so... Oh, maybe okay, a good time ahead. for a question. We've got a few questions popping up in the chat, if uh, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, first one is, uh, is there any estimate on when the lens, the, the 25 to 250, will be available? Yeah. What we are uh, saying at this point um, with with any of the products that we announced today is later this year. Great. Um, another question that came up was, will the um, extension units uh, made for the uh, C500 uh, Mark II work on the C300 Mark II, specifically uh, using V-mount batteries? Absolutely. 100%. Please, please, please use them. Oh. <laughs> and we have an example of that. Um, yeah. And forgive me, I forget the name of I got the one here attachment. Too. And of course, Paul's holding one. Nice. But yeah. with the V-mount batteries and the fact that you can have uh, extra audio potentiometers right at the user's uh, side, not on like the opposite side of the camera, right at the basically cheek of the operator. That's great. And uh, yeah. just two other, I think, relatively quick questions. One, is there a time lapse feature in the C300 Mark III? <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah an interval recording yeah right no yeah unfortunately that one is uh left out of this model so but that's what you use the eos r for <laughs> right there you go or your five five ds five dsr which do that you know really really well um and then lastly for now anyway uh we didn't get a, a a solid figure on dynamic range for the for the new camera. What's uh, what are we specking it? What are you guys specking it at? So yeah, there, I mean the the official spec is what we we're saying is is over sixteen stops. Basically, this oh. what, sixteen plus stops is what I'm basically allowed to say. So great. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That's all the questions for for the moment. Thank you, Jeff. Cool. So another interesting point too uh, was mentioned that there's an HDR to SDR monitoring. So obviously a lot of shows are being shot in HDR. We're not all going to have SDR monitors on location, but the cinematographer needs to be able to see what they're capturing. So can you talk a little bit about sort of the plus minus modes within the uh, camera for the HDR monitoring? Yeah, definitely. We'll talk a little bit. So basically the camera, you can shoot natively in an HDR mode. Uh, whether it's PQ or HLG, if you want. Now, I mean, when you're outputting those modes, you're not going to, unless you have, like, unless you have a, a Dolby Vision monitor or if you have uh, a monitor that specs for for HDR, um, you're obviously not going to be able to see, see the dynamic range. So what's happening is it gives you an option to, to output um, in a, a change of, gain basically through the, the SDIs and uh, and it allows you to to kind of more match closer to what you would see 
on the HDR mode. So like, yeah, give me an example, Ryan. Yeah, give me an example of that. Like say the highlights, yeah. per, like highlight protection. Right. Um, so, I mean, if you're shooting HDR uh, and you're, you know, you're properly exposing for HDR, especially outside, you know, your your SDR is going to be, you know, woefully unexposed. Right. So you can um, so you can you can bring that back up. There's a plus or minus seven dB on the outputs um, mm -hmm. that you can choose from. And I think, uh, you know, anybody who's really used it has, has kind of uh, played around in the, the, the plus and minus 3 dB uh, range on it. And that provides a really good translation um, uh, from going from HDR to on an SDR monitor. Right, and I guess a good example of that might be when they're shooting in the cockpit. They want to be able to see the details of the instrumentation in the cockpit, but also out the window. But they're looking at an SDR monitor, they may need to play with that dB plus minus setting a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So it just gives you flexibility. I mean, just like the C500 Mark II, this camera has a lot of flexibility as far as the outputs go. Um, you have interlaced uh, options on, on every frame rate, you know, no matter what you're recording internally, um, you've got interlaced options or progressive options. Um, so it's just a lot of compatibility because we really see this camera as, as making a place for itself in, you know, in the broadcast world and sports and live events as well. Um, it's going to be a very versatile camera. So we want to provide you know as many output options as possible All right and you definitely mentioned that in the live stream about the 12g sdi output for yeah. 4k to a, a, a monitor that supports it of course mm -hmm. and same goes with hdmi what, what type of options do we have there yeah so with hdmi we get a uh, we get 4k output up to 60 frames a second and it is also 10-bit 422 and uh and one thing i just just want to make note of that is I, I feel like I have to say it is that one thing about that on the C500 Mark II is that you can't use the HDMI and the 3G SDI at the same time and uh, that's still a big taste on this camera as well okay. yeah the just HDMI the 12G SDI still take works precedent. the 12G SDI will still work yep okay I'm sorry Ryan I cut you off Oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted. The uh, the HDMI will always take precedent precedence over the 3G uh, monitor on there. Yeah. yeah. So as but soon as you plug in HDMI, the monitor out the the 12G SDI and of course the HDMI and sort of yeah. any combination of that makes sense for the production. All right. Um, you know, obviously this is pretty exciting, and you mentioned that this would be. 2020, because I'm sure a lot of what's happening in the world right now is affecting production, but we're definitely going to see some of these this year, we're thinking. Yeah, you know, as far as we've been told, 2020. So, okay. yeah. Absolutely. Looking forward to it then, of course. Um, I think it also mentioned what the accessories that the camera comes with. Are they going to be pretty similar to what the C500 Mark II came with in terms of the handles and the screen and everything else? Yeah, um, yeah, I know I didn't get into like what's in the box um, on the, the press conference, but I mean, basically, it's it's the same stuff, uh, except for with the C500 Mark II, we launched it with the um, uh, the 512 gig CF Express card and card reader package, and that is not happening for the C300 Mark III. So you get the top handle, you get um, the the LCD, the 4.3 inch LCD touchscreen monitor, um, the cable for that, the bracket for that, the side hand grip. Um, so, and all, you know, all that other, all that other stuff. But, yeah. Basically yeah, everything you see here minus the lens is, is what comes with it. Yeah. The, uh, the big, the big battery, EPA 60 and a single port charger as well. Oh, so the BPA-60 is included? It is included, yeah. Yeah, yeah just like it was in the C500 as well. Yeah. You, cannot, you can use the uh, A30, uh, but mm -hmm. the 60 obviously is going to give you the best life. Right. Of course, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can strip it down, which is kind of what uh, I like about this graphic. It just shows the, kind of at the barest form without anything else on a gimbal or some other uh, apparatus. You can build mm -hmm. it up this way or, or go quite as large as something that, you know, the gang was using for uh, Boneyard Ballet. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah. that's really the beauty of it is, you know, you can build it out to, you know, a nice shoulder mount, uh, you know, with V mounts and, you know, four channels of XLR and, 
you know, lens port and everything that you need for that. Um, but the beauty of it is you don't need any of the expansion units for the, you know, highest quality recording. It's all happening internally in this configuration. Yeah. And on well, Boneyard, they, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. I say on Boneyard, they really, they really ran the gamut on setups on that, that little short. They had, I mean, everything, jibs and drones and gimbals and handheld and, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, they really put it through its spaces. Yeah, uh, it's just a beautiful piece. And of course, like you said, all the behind the scenes photos are so interesting to see exactly your point, all of the various mm -hmm. things that they're putting the camera through. Um, and, and of course, a lens. We can't forget that they were testing the lens as well. <laughs> uh, but any other I'm questions sure from the internet audience? Yes. Yeah. A uh, couple questions came in. Uh, one was uh, at, someone was asking about the newly announced firmware updates. Uh, in particular, like adding the proxy recording uh, on the C500 uh, yeah. to a rough estimate or time frame when those those should be available. Yeah. Again, uh, what what we're allowed to say is is later this year. Okay. Right on. And then <clears throat> I think this is something that's on a lot of people's mind uh, right now. But are there either solutions that, that you all found or specifically any products or um, packages that would allow the C300 Mark III to be used in a streaming context. So, I mean, you know, theoretically with, uh, with any of your streaming boxes, it should work out as, you know, especially an SDI one, the 3G SDI out will give you the, the, the 1080 out to it and there shouldn't be any issues there the hdmi output as well you um to be able to run that to like you know an elgato or some you know black magic or you know whatever and shouldn't have any problems there um i honestly am not i'm not aware of any 12g streaming uh boxes but i could totally be wrong about that um maybe the larger black magic like the um system can do it but um. yeah the uh yeah. the ultra studio mm -hmm. uh, the, the rack mounted ultra studio um the thunderbolt 3 the extreme yeah. 4k extreme 3 uh would would be able to take in a 12g okay. SDI signal and present that on uh certainly on the mac as a capture device which okay. then be yeah. routed to a, a variety of different streaming front ends so on that note, let me ask the Wi-Fi adapter, the WFT, is that that doesn't involve streaming, but you have a file transfer and remote control via like a iPad or other device? Yeah. Yeah. Works with the browser remote uh, function. But no streaming as of right now. No, no streaming. Yeah. Through the uh, through the WFT nine through the browser through the uh, Wi-Fi. Right. If you go if you go Ethernet, um, the camera does have an IP streaming mode. It's an IP streaming uh, mode that has been around since we put out the C700. Um, very very low megabit per second, um, and it does need to be run through a hardware uh, or software um, encoder decoder to uh, to function. Um, it is there. I think the, the preferred method for most people is to make use of the, the clean HDMI output and the, uh, the, the SDI outputs to, to get uh, a really you know, good uh, customizable stream. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, are there any other questions? One question that came up uh, was, is there, there the ability to, like on the older generation, Cinema EOS cameras to assign a button somewhere on the body to take a still photo with the current uh, picture style applied. Yeah, um, I'm going to set it up right now on my camera just to make sure. But yeah, there is still photo right there. A lot of people um, find that really useful for you know scouting or BTS stills or just things that you need to keep track of. Um, and so if you're in a 4K recording mode, what, would that be a 4K still? So I'm going to have to, actually, I don't know the resolution of that photo, but I'm pretty sure it's going, 
Um, it's going to the SD card. So I'm going to guess that's going to be a uh, a 2K yeah. capture Got right there. Got it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the experts, I like it. One one question is, um, could you just cover the total uh, kind of universe of what the user interchangeable mounts means and what mounts are available? Yeah, for sure. Um, so on the front of the camera, and I don't know, I don't know if you can see this right here is probably going to be out of focus. There's four four screws on here. I removed those four screws. And pretty much the entire, there's a little front plate unit here that will come out. And the other mounts that we have, the camera comes with the standard EF mount, but I can buy a locking EF mount, which is kind of like a, it's kind of like a, a hybrid of an EF and a PL in a way. It has the, the locking mechanism of a, a positive lock, um, but it's still an EF mount. And that was, I mean, that was really designed uh, to try to mitigate some of the, um, you know, some of the, the, you know, if I'm, if I'm putting a lens, an EF mount lens on there and I'm holding by the lens and I'm really working on that mount, there might not be as stable on the standard EF mount as it would be on this lockdown um, mount. So that's kind of the reason for, for that. And then the other one, of course, is the PL mount. And I mean, the, the PL mount is kind of the no brainer in a way. It's uh, all of the lenses that you could ever want, really. Um, you know, so most of the lenses out there in the cinema world are all PL mounts. So, uh, and I think vast majority wise, that's the, the one that people are looking at getting. So. Yeah. yeah and you mentioned this. It always the ships with the one. Oh, I'm good. I keep the, yeah, to say, uh, you mentioned the <laughs> shims, uh, come with that. Uh, yeah. so whatever mounts you get, you're getting shims. Mm -hmm. Um, Jeff, I believe you're basically going to ask if, um, you, you you buy the camera, you, you it comes as an EF now. That's the only way. Yeah. yeah. So the I think it's also important to note that the, uh, I think it's important to note also that uh, no matter what you're using EF or PL, we actually have a um, uh, the MO4E or MOPE, which mm -hmm. is our um, uh, two third inch adapter as well. So if you had uh, you know if your broadcast station using this as uh, you know your creative services cam, but then you know want to throw um, you know a two third inch on there for something, you can do that. Yeah, that's a good. It's a good thing to point out, Ryan. Uh, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, if you are a broadcaster, have a lot of legacy lenses. There's no reason to, or a big box lens. There's no reason to think that you can't use it on any of these cameras. So then kind of another question then regarding the history of C300, the Mark II, now the Mark III, uh, what's going to happen with the Mark II? Well, it, uh, it got a price drop today. So there's uh, that start. So, but I mean, it's still around. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's still the, the workhorse. So, um, you know, yeah. No, that makes sense. I mean, obviously, it's been one of the most popular cameras for quite some time now, and this is nice to have sort of that next next step. Uh, for those that don't need the C500's full frame or the 5.9K, you know, the C300 Mark III slots in as kind of a nice S35, which is, uh, you know, a great universe to... And we have a lot of lenses that still work yeah. with that, so I want to keep that workflow supported. Great. Let's see. I don't have a lot of other questions because I feel like we've covered everything pretty uh, in, in detail, but definitely want to make sure that anyone on a YouTube live stream is able to ask those questions that we haven't addressed yet. So please let us know if there's anything else. Or if Ryan or Paul, if you have anything else that you wanted to add that I forgot to ask, please, please do. I think, I think we covered pretty much everything, at least on the lens side of things. Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah, pretty exhaustive kind of. Uh, we didn't talk too much about this, but Canalog two and Canalog three support, of course, still built in. Yeah, yeah, and and again, um, and I'm glad you brought that up actually because it's it's something that we should talk about. Um, to get the full dynamic range of the camera, you have to shoot with Canalog two. So again, and that's just like all of our previous, you know, the C300 Mark two and and up from there. It was always you shoot with Canon Log two, and that's how you get the the most dynamic range out of the sensor. Um, 
And that still applies to here, except for now the dynamic range is expanded. So, and that was one of the beautiful things about Canalog too, is that it was a, a log curve that was designed for growth. And so, yeah. Is, um, I'm actually getting a question. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, and also is the, um, uh, pardon me, it just, it just escaped me, but uh, come back to me. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, time code and gen lock on this camera? Yeah, yeah, good things to bring up. Absolutely. So yes, the camera has a, uh, a BNC for time code input and output. Um, and gen lock, though, the gen lock is not in the body. And that's where the expansion units come in. So with the, the EU V1 or the EU V2. Now the, the EU V1, I might actually I might actually have it here. Give me, give me one second. On and, then, and then while you're looking for that, you, I know you can answer this off the top of your head. What is the base ISO? For Canalog 2, the base Canalog 2 and Canalog 3, the base ISO is 800. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have it on here. But so the the expansion unit one is an expansion unit that gives you the Genlock, a full size RS422 connector, and the Ethernet port. So on the camera body itself, for in terms of networking, you have a a LANC connector, which we call Remote A, um, but we don't have the full size RS422. And so if you're looking at some kind of system integration or you want to get uh, deep into the broadcast or live, you know, live broadcasts, um, the expansion units really come into play there. Uh, oh, yeah. Hey, the RCV100. Or if you want to utilize something yeah. like this. Yeah. RCV100 that has the ability to use remote A or remote B, which is the 422. So you've got a full paint box capability here, which works with both the camera great. Um, I'll put a plug in for the lens as well. If it's connected via EF mount, you can control focus, zoom, and iris off of this as well. Yeah. Actually, that brings up a good point about the lens. Uh, I know previously the Sentinel 120 with the servo, you had to take the uh, multi-pin Hiroshi cable and plug it into the, I guess, sort of back into the mount that's on the back of the lens. We're in an EF mode. Is that still accurate? Yep. It's got the same the same input on there. It's right uh, right on the back, and yep, you just on. Undo that cap and it plugs right back into it. Yeah. If you're using it on a body that supports it, you could plug it into the camera body and then it directly. Right. Yeah, you're you're getting power through the, the power through the mount. Yeah. 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 Speaking of power, uh, a couple questions popping up. One, what is the uh, the input voltage for the camera? Um, either you know from a battery or from a, a DC in, and then can you uh, Give us an estimate on what the total power consumption or dissipation in watts would be while the camera was recording with the EVF in the mix. Well, with the EVF in the mix. So I actually, I'm going to have to pull up the number on the, uh, for the wattage um, because I just don't have it right here in front of me. Sure, sure. Um, do, 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 do. But it does take a standard four pin XLR power supply yeah, for so, using the V2 module, right? Yeah. And so the camera is definitely rated for uh, uh, basically 12, I mean, it says 12 to 20 volts on it. So if you're using a four pin XLR, you know, hopefully you're not blowing past 20 volts out of that four pin, you know. Um, right. But, uh, but yeah, so kind of 12 volt input for your, your mainline power. Um, and then again, the BPA batteries itself, though, you know, they're they're coming in, they're outputting fourteen point four volts out of the BPA batteries. So, so nothing's really changed there in that that power mm -hmm. department. Uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, I just don't have the. We have a number for the running time. I just don't have it in in my head, so okay. I'll have to look it up. Yeah. Um. One other new question: um, When you record internal 4K, um, are you does that do anything to your video outputs? Does it does it introduce any limitations to SDI or HDMI output? It does. So, and that comes from the 12G SDI. So if I'm in if I'm recording internal 4K, my 12G SDI output is tied to that. So that means that I have to output 
the 4K from that, that port. So that's the thing is that if I was hoping to use a 1080 monitor out of that SDI port, I won't be able to um, because I'm sending out at least 6G out of that, por that port if I'm in 4K. So. And then the if, HDMI at that point resolution should be able to scale the HDMI. I'll just take a look right now. I believe you can. Yeah. yeah. Um, back to the another point about the that 12G SDI. If I'm shooting in uh, in 2K, right, then it's going to scale itself to the 2K. So. So if I'm shooting, say I'm shooting 2K, 30 frame, uh, 24 frames a second, um, then it actually is sending a 3G output through that 12G SDI. And so I can use a 1080 monitor um, with, a, with a 3G input. Great. Was that the last question? I still won't come in, but was that... So, all right. Well, uh, if there's no other questions coming from our YouTube live audience, uh, why don't you give one final opportunity for those for those last minute questions? In the meantime, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Ryan and Paul for joining us today. I'm sure they had a very busy day with their live stream announcement, <laughs> and they carve out a little bit of time to spend with us. We do appreciate that. Uh, but again, hope everyone is staying safe. And uh, you know, we're looking forward to seeing more with these cameras. It's exciting to see new developments in the cinema EOS world. Optics and camera are always welcome. Uh, it's great to see the sort of evolution from the original C300, C100, you know, down to where we are now today with uh, 500 Mark II and the 300 Mark III. So, Jeff, just last thing, any other questions? One that came in uh, just at the at the kind of the last minute. Um, when you're using the uh, utilizing the um, the dual gain output, mm -hmm. is it possible to use the camera in a low light mode or somehow get it to behave like a dual ISO feature, or is the secondary gain only possible at at the time of capture on chip, so to speak? Yeah, and this again, it's I know it, this is kind of the the confusing aspect of it because that's what he's describing there is more of like a a dual native ISO type of system, and it, it's not that at all. Um, this is a strictly down to the sensor level type of thing, and uh, and we don't have any control of what that gain. We don't have any control of what those gains are, or, or anything like that. Um, you know, the only thing we have is just when you 60 frames or above 60 frames a second in 4K, and you're you're using the the older dynamic range, but below that up to 60 frames a second and 60 frames a second the this mode is is kicked in so and it, it's yeah. automatic or it's configurable in the menus yep. automatic automatic yeah yep. yeah so as far as low light you know obviously the cameras uh, you know the canon you know cinema eos capability that hasn't changed um you know, the way that the, the 800 base ISO for Canon Log 2 and 3 is, is that once you're at that 800, um, you get a, uh, a repeatable, predictable uh, stop difference between highlights and shadows as you go up from 800, you know, all the way up to, you know, native uh, or, uh, you know, the, 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 the top end of the, the, the native ISOs, um, something like, are, are we at 52,000, Paul, I think, on this one? You know, what... Once you once you get you know, all the way from 800 all the way up, you're getting that even split. Um, once you drop below 800 is when you start taking away highlight protection and adding it to shadow uh, latitude. So this camera operates the same way. It's just you know like Paul said at the sensor level um, we're, we're we're basically pushing you know the two different images um, the two exact same images through different amplifiers to increase that that overall dynamic range. Yeah, and Paul, I think you had a great uh, example of that during your presentation. You had a graphic that showed essentially what was your, you essentially used for your dual pixel autofocus, but you guys, yeah. I believe the engineers are now also utilizing that for the dual gain output sort of magic that happens with the Digic 7. Exactly. Yeah, and it's it's the sensor, so that's the thing is that because it's, it's you know, we're talking like 
like pre digit seven in the terms of the, the flow of it because it's at the sensor level and so that's why it was an entirely new sensor designed around this feature but using you know but still we still have to have dual pixel autofocus in there so it's still you know using the the theories behind the the previous sensors so great fantastic well, again, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Paul and Ryan for joining us today for this sort of a sneak peek uh, at this camera, uh, even though we don't have it in front of me, or at least I don't. Uh, <laughs> but we're looking forward to seeing this in the future months and weeks coming up. And yeah, by all means, please check out the footage that they've shot. Uh, Boneyard Ballet is beautiful. There's going to be a bunch of behind-the-scenes photos and sort of inter interviews with the crew. Uh, I want to thank Paul and Ryan again very much for this and thank you so much for joining us today so guys thank you appreciate it thank you yeah thanks Jeff good to see you of course our pleasure so with that we'll sign off for now take care see you next time everyone <laughs>